This is American Steel Studios, and it used to be, I guess, American Steel Company, like an actual steel distributor. So it continues with people actually, actually manufacturing things. But now it's like a different style of manufacturing, right? <laughs> right, instead of having a giant assembly line that makes the same widget day in and day out, you have more micro fabrication kind of stuff where you can make a lot of the same widget, but you can just as easily change between a variety of things or customize at really low unit quantity. So this is this shipping container based factory. We call it shop in a box. So the heart of the shop is this table. This is a plasma cutter mounted on a CNC. CNC just means computer numerically controlled. All the little 3D printers that are all the rage right now, those are another example of a CNC. And all it means is that you're using a computer to control movement. In this case, we're doing X, Y, and Z. So horizontally, vertically, and up and down. And what that lets us do is really precisely, like sub-millimeter in this case precision, move an industrial tool to do our work for us. So it's kind of like, in a lot of ways, almost a new artisanal in that, you know, instead of the artist sitting there and carefully scraping away to get the exact detail in wood, they can create a digital file, customize it for every client, and you know, still get an incredibly high quality product, but take advantage of modern technology to do the parts that are just repetitive. So like, for example, if I wanna cut a lid, basically what I'm doing is loading the G-code for whatever component I wanna cut. So like, this is the vent plate for one of our kilns. This is G-code explaining to the machine exactly how to move. G00Z3.81, that's telling it, I forget what the, the G is like defining a tool or a speed or something, and then it's saying move the Z axis 3.81 units. So then does that. So you're able to very quickly translate from being in design software and figuring out what it is you wanna cut to actually cutting it in the real world. This is the G code loaded, like I would then hit run and we'd start cutting this. It'll just move around. You, even, you can even see in the software where it's actually moving as you go. And then you can also edit this. You can define like, oh, I want it to move faster. There are presets for different thicknesses of metal. So you're able to, you know, I'm still buying steel to iterate on these, but it's to the point where I'm able to buy steel and iterate on it in quantity one. So actually shooting plasma, the fourth state of matter, at the metal to melt it, which is pretty crazy. So we're getting to where it's as easy to make one-offs of something nearly as easy as it is to make large quantities, which is really exciting. I'm obsessed with shipping containers. Aesthetically, they're this great industrial thing. In terms of building, it simplifies things a lot, especially if you don't do what many others do and cut them up into small chunks. If you maintain their shipping containerness, you've got a solid roof, a super solid structure. They stack them like eight high at sea in hurricanes. And typically they come with a wood floor that's sometimes salvageable, sometimes not. And you're talking about something that's like typically under two grand. So this is the space I use for a variety of projects now. The main thing is with Rechar, our biochar company. We needed a way in the middle of rural Kenya to make our product, we call it Climate Kiln. So yeah, this is like pretty much a representation of the setup we use in Africa. It's a $60 device for farmers that lets them burn their scrap waste to create charcoal. This is our latest product, it's our Climate Kiln Mini. You put a small piece that we send of expanded metal in, it goes to right above here, and then you pack it with basically any carbon-based waste. Newspaper, leaves, all of those work great. And this is the lid for our larger kiln, the current model that we deploy in Kenya. Basically what we're doing is, with either of these, we're doing a controlled burn. So this is the primary air inlet, and this is secondary. You pack it full of stuff, and then just light it in here. And what we're getting, the chimney creates something called, appropriately, the chimney effect that creates, basically it's like a suction fan on the fire, pulling it up through there, making it burn hotter, 
and combusting a lot of the nasty byproducts you get from like an open field fire. So they're taking what they would otherwise do in a dirty, slow, open field fire, putting it in our specially designed kiln and making something that lets them cut their fertilizer use in half while also increasing their yields. And this is what the actual biochar looks like. When you use charcoal agriculturally, it's called biochar. We call it black revolution because the green revolution was, of course, the use of carbon intensive fertilizers back in the 60s, 70s and later. So this is our carbon negative potting soil. And here's some of the parts. Here's the vent handles, the vent plate. This is going to become the lid, the removable lid. Chimney. Basically, I'm able to more or less make everything here. This is a, a pretty low cost and low weight process to get to all of the parts we need to make that. What's really cool about being here is there's a lot of knowledge that doesn't translate well to the internet, like how to work with sheet metal is this thing where you can find a couple of books on it, but I, you know, I, and I have found them and I've started reading them. I can also just work out of somewhere like here and have my buddy Jim wonder by and solve for me something that I've spent two weeks online issuing. Like, this guy is to put a seam on it. He's like, put a seam on the side. You can use thinner metal. And of course, that lets me use thinner metal. You'll see the result of that on here. So otherwise, we'd have to like use significantly thicker metal. It would increase our cost, produce these like 30%. And it looks great. This vertical seam is just exactly what you need to do to add rigidity to thin sheet metal like this, which sure saves a lot of time compared to having to discover all of it through trial and error. What's really exciting is like increasingly we're able to customize in small quantity and iterate in small quantity. These are both prototypes, all three of these actually are prototypes for different collapsible versions where they'll bolt together. Uh, that lid style we're not going to use but was an important prototype to learn from. Um, up there you'll see the prototype of a gasifier that Jason did a couple of years ago. Next to it is a toilet, part of a toilet that we prototyped, like a biochar based human sanitation solution. This stuff's been around for years. What's new and crazy is that it's becoming something that super small businesses and even hobbyists increasingly can afford. This used to be like a $50,000 plus setup just for the table and the software around it. Now, this was two DIY kits that I put together. Our total cost, including the torch, came to about $6,000 total. And that's going down from there. This shipping container based factory, what it represents is the first in a lot of steps that we're taking towards making hardware like software, by which I mean that it's easy to scale. You can reproduce on a wide basis the same thing and you're able to do very small unit runs. You're able to do like a new revision of your hardware product every day rather than this monolithic like the 2001 model car, the 2002 model car. That's not how the real world works, right? You want things that are much more customized to your actual goals. And then if I want to go back in and make changes to the actual design, I can open up CAD, people call it, computer-aided design or drafting. And then there's CAN, the actual computer-aided machining, the software to actually control the machine. So if I want to make changes, I can literally open up CAD or CAM software and make edits to what it is we're actually producing. So here, for example, I'm opening up that same shape. You see this is in the CAM software. So it's defining this S0, S1 is showing me the cut order. You can actually simulate the cut, too. So this is showing me, okay, here, it's going to move here. In here, I can edit the lead-ins, the lead-outs. I can define things differently. I can change the cut order. And then to change the actual design, it's opening up a different piece of software on my laptop, for example, editing the design. If I want this to be twice as big or like something's not working right, like the E needs a wider definition to work in metal, that's 10 minutes loading a new file and you're able to change what physical object you're producing. We have this same capability in our shop in Kenya. 
and we're literally able to send digital files over email back and forth to make design changes. So that, that was the, the onus for building this shipping container based factory. My buddy Jason, who started ReachR, was getting some traction with some biochar tests that he was doing in Kenya. So he needed a way to produce the kiln in the middle of, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Pretty much like we wanted it to be entirely self-reliant so that we'd have to send nothing. We wanted to do, instead of a 100-mile food diet, we wanted to do a 100-mile manufacturing diet. We were able to actually get all of our metal, most of it as scrap, as scrap oil barrels. So it's a really flexible setup, and we're able to do it incredibly low cost. All, including shipping, it was well under $40,000 to deploy a factory. All right, good. We're able to really quickly iterate changes back and forth. So I thought at first that it would be me largely dictating to our team, oh, here's the change we're going to make now. But it was much more interactive. I'm learning as much and changing as much with our product from our team in the field in Kenya, as much if not more than they are from me. So basically, there are different setups for different tools where you can use this same table to do different stuff. A laser cutter, for example, is the same basic tooling setup, slightly different, you know, it's a CNC, slightly different goals, like you're optimizing for different things with your choice of motors and stuff, but still doing essentially the same thing. So this is the actual electrode and nozzle where the plasma, so basically I'm just cleaning off some buildup. Physical stuff like this is rewarding, right? Like, it's cool that this is a real thing and not just something blinking on screen. It's funny, my grandma, who's 85, she was like, why are you welding? Because that was, you know, from Pittsburgh, that working in the steel mill was like a job, but on the line doing actual fabrication was like the worst of those, you know, a job's good, but that's a dirty, messy job. And I was trying to, I just related it to computers for, I'm like, this is, we're making things with computers. You've got this whole maker movement really disrupting the cost of manufacturing. As you see more and more people get bored with their, with their jobs sitting at computers and start tinkering. Like, things like MakerBot are you know, essentially toys, but important toys. They're the start of a process. This is the same basic technology of movement, just scaled up. Contrary to being the end of the traditional craftsman, as many people would claim, there's still a lot, I would argue, I'd argue that this is just super empowering the designer in that you don't have to deal with all these artificial limitations from production processes as much. Like, there's still reality. You can't, like, there are trade-offs. If you make something that is not designed for manufacturing in some ways, it's going to cost drastically more and take drastically longer to manufacture. But the cool thing now is that whether you choose to build in a shipping container or scale to a factory, should be, that should be a conscious choice. You should never be forced as a maker of things defined broadly, so whether it's an art project or like something on the shelves at Walmart, you should never be forced into one of these production models or limited as a designer by your tool set. You should understand the trade-offs, but you shouldn't be limited by it. This will be the vent plate. I think we're heading to more choice. Like the sign, everything's screwed up. That's true, but that's a good thing. Like we are heading towards an unordered system where I don't care too much, obviously, about the clothes I'm wearing. So I can buy a $5 made in some low cost country shirt. But if I do care a lot about my bicycle, I can buy it from someone around the corner. 
designed to my exact specs with his professional feedback made in his garage. What we just cut is, I call it the vent plate. This is our latest product, so it's aimed at like, you know, urban or hobbyist. You're able to control the characteristics with this vent plate. This provides more or less primary ventilation. And yeah, you're able to produce in small quantities biochar to use in your garden. So I think we're moving to where we have more of a spectrum of choices. I think that the onus is on us as creators of things, and that is that should be everyone to build the systems we want by ignoring the ones we don't. This is basically like an experimentation lab for a bunch of different stuff that I want to try. Because it turns out we know remarkably little about how to optimally grow different things. And you know, that's kind of problematic. It's a pretty it's a pretty core important thing for us to survive as a species. We might wanna might wanna figure that out. The one I'm most excited about right now is this one. These awesome, they actually call themselves Team Awesome. These 14 year olds showed me a great, I've been researching aeroponics for a while and they showed me this amazing setup they invented where it's about $40 in cost for this setup. Just, you know, five gallon bucket. They found this special pump inside, which I had been unable to find after like a year of trying. Aeroponics is, they're using an ultrasonic fogger, this little guy. So basically, I and other people had looked at these, but none of us had been able to get it to work like this. I tried like an ultrasonic dehumidifier and it didn't quite work right. It was just leaking all over the place. I was trying to like precisely seal the top. They figured out you can just have foam sit on top. The weight of the roots will hold it down. And if you get this special setup, it just turns on only when it's in water. So unlike the setups I'd used before, it doesn't burn out. And it's just a little float in there. These were literally like six to a pack seedlings two and a half, three weeks ago. And especially the squash, they're just going crazy. I've never seen growth like this. And the roots are out of control. This team, uh, team Awesome, this team of 14 year olds have figured out a setup way cooler than any of, any of the professional researchers or ag school papers I've read and way cooler than what I was able to either. So. so right now, you have these two crazy magic boxes in your kitchen. One costs a couple hundred bucks and heats food up. One costs a couple hundred bucks and keeps food cold. There's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't have a third magic box that produces, with no work from you, all of your fresh fruits. And then another one that does all of your fresh vegetables. The science is there. We just kind of need to build it. I think it's very much one of those things that sounds ridiculous until somebody builds it. Then everybody will be like, of course we grow all our food automatically in our kitchen. Just as, it's, as it seems silly after refrigerators became common not to be able to keep food cold. So these are basically a bunch of experiments in what works sense for growing with as little environmental footprint and as little land footprint because not everyone has, has acres of yards anymore as we can. So I want to get to where we have zero square foot straight vertical setups like this, which is another just open source design I found and I'm trying to modify. What's so exciting about, about where we're at right now, the tools are cheaper than ever and people are sharing more than ever before. So this is GrowerBot. I call it a social gardening assistant. What it does is let you monitor and share a variety of the things that your plants care about that you're not able to just walk up to them and see. Like I, unfortunately, my eyeballs can't be like, oh, it's 830 lux at this angle. Fortunately, I have a $2 sensor. I can move it around and evaluate. Like here, this distance from the light, it's 1200 lux. Growerbot measures a variety of light characteristics, soil conductivity, which is a corollary for, if you know a certain amount of other things about it, you can tell moisture and or fertilizer level from it with a bunch of caveats. Airs, humidity, and temperature. It measures all of those and then does two key things. One, it controls, if you plug in by the water symbol, a pump, it'll turn on a pump to water your plants when they're thirsty. And two, you can run a supplemental light from another AC outlet controlled by it when your plants want more light than they're getting naturally. And you can adjust these, importantly. You can change them by like 1% or less moisture level for the plants and like one second or one lux less or more on the cutoff for how much light your plants get. And then all of that is shared, if you choose to, to your friends over Wi-Fi, which streams to a site like this. So for example, today I moved the grow robot at my house to a different window than I had it in before and I have it sitting there measuring and updating every couple seconds the humidity, light, 
moisture and temperature levels. And you can see like right now it's 18.9 degrees Celsius, updated a couple seconds ago. Last 30 minutes you see the temperature has changed a bit, but it's been like within one degree Celsius. You can see the moisture level not changing much. I just plugged it in this morning, so it was at zero before that. But right here this spike is when I actually put it in to the plant. And you see it pretty much stable over time for the last couple hours. The light level, again, when I plugged it in. And humidity, you actually see changing a bit over time. So it's gone up. When I set it up, it was about 80%, and it's about 88% now. It's sitting in a really warm window. So to me, this is the start of the tools we need to, one, make this data accessible, two, start making changes and varying our setup slightly, and three, probably most importantly, making it something that is fun. Some friends of mine and I mocked up something we called Seed Mogul. So like Farmville in real life. You have sensor readings, you have your garden layout, you get points for doing different actions in the game that are beneficial to you, one, your garden, and two, sharing data. Like every day you share data, you get a point. Points are seeds. So basically it's a Ponzi scheme that's actually sustainable because plants produce more seeds than they use. If you grow heirloom, you can produce hundreds of seeds from one plant. If we can gamify growing things where you're sharing data with your friends, you're earning. If you look at the participation numbers on Farmville, they're absurd. If we could get people with real food to share data like that, and people spend real money on it too. And all they're doing is taking advantage of our lizard brain basic desires for response, reward, stimuli. So I made this at Tech Shop on laser cutters. This is just really inexpensive quarter inch plywood. Actually, some of the cheaper stuff works better than some of the expensive plywoods. My previous version of this, I called it Garduino, like gardening Arduino. So it was basically just a shield for the Arduino. It's like a $35 popular physical computing platform. Then you kind of had to solder it all together. Wasn't very attractive. This is like, to me, it's very much a maker aesthetic. Like this isn't quite to where my mom's going to use it. But it's a step in the right direction. And hacker spaces let us scale from just the bare minimum exposed circuit board industrial thing that I might use to something this isn't quite there, but a later version you could see it being like a mom friendly thing. So this one is kind of like a hybrid. It works connected, but you can also just go. This is an Arduino variant I built. It integrates something called the electric imp for Wi So it's one board that does Wi Fi and has an Arduino. If I lick my finger and put it on it, you'll see it jumps way up. Where we're going with GrowerBot, my goal I'm most excited about with it is eventually, yeah, a couple years from now, getting it to where it's this magical box in your kitchen that automatically grows heirloom vegetables for you. Plug it in and it works. Um, in the meantime, the next big version of it that we're doing is going to be something called Soil IQ. It's going to be more or less this form factor, and then on top there'll be a solar panel, our light sensor, integrated in here will be the batteries and the soil probes, humidity and temperature sensor here, so basically the sensors from this, minus all this complication, plus a Bluetooth connection, because we realized with our work in Africa, one of the reasons, like we sold something like 1,300 kilns over a year or so, and it was cool, but it wasn't nearly as scalable as we need it to be to have the impact in terms of sustainability and like staying in business profitability that we need. So we started thinking about things that have grown as quickly as we want sustainable solutions for more autonomy broadly to grow. Only two things we could think of worldwide are Coca-Cola and cell phones. And we couldn't really think of any logical way to piggyback off of Coca-Cola, but for cell phones, we thought about what if we could create a Bluetooth accessory that lets farmers in the app buy fertilizer. Fertilizer changes hands 10 times before it gets to a farmer in Kenya, for example. They can take readings with this and it'll be under $20. So they take this, it's solar powered. They link it to their phone over Bluetooth, take a reading, it comes up on their phones. That reading is shared with GPS location. So we create the first really in-depth soil map digitally that anyone has ever done. They're incentivized in our app via things like the ability to buy fertilizer at a discount to share the actual results of the different experiments they do. I'm tired of reading about dudes like Stuart Brand writing the whole earth catalog, which is like so much cooler than anything that I've found that my generation's done yet. I'm tired of reading about them building all this stuff and then the knowledge just being lost. I mean, people were doing all this stuff that we're talking about with permaculture and sustainability back in the 60s and they were doing it better in a lot of ways. The only way we can possibly catch up and maybe make some progress is if we just share much more widely.
In theory, that aeroponics bucket is doing awesome. I'm excited about it. But I'm also excited about this minimalist, just bubbling setup where the water just sets down there. And then I really like the idea that this takes up zero square feet of ground space per plant that you're growing. So I think the biggest thing needs to be that totally do what I and everyone else does and geek out about all the details of it, but experiment and share it. Don't get religion about it to the degree where, like for a while I wasn't doing aeroponics trials, so I was like, oh, we need to get to 10 to 15 micron size, because that's what this NASA paper says is the optimal moisture droplet size. And I need to figure out a 400 PSI pump and a $300 nozzle to do that. You just need to check yourself. Yeah, cool, do those experiments if you can, but more importantly, do experiments, period. You can't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. You don't need every tool. You don't need the optimal setup before you get started experimenting with it. These are expanded clay pellets mixed with a little biochar, just a standard hydroponic fertilizer, water, and then an air stone in the bottom to bubble it. You need some source of either alternating air and water or something to basically like stir up the water from, from my very limited understanding for a hydroponic setup to work. It's also going to be much more satisfying when, you know, you can download some software that is for your given location, your given growing style, how to produce the optimal heirloom tomato. And then when you improve it or screw it up, that should, just like it does with web pages now, like there's no reason we shouldn't do that with agriculture. We're a couple million trials from that. That's going to take forever if we just leave it to ag tech universities and others to do. That's going to take a couple months if we get widely distributed networks of people automatically sharing their data, incentivized because it's actually fun and food tastes really good when you grow it well, doing that. It's basically applying agile development to ideas that are physical. Yeah, and for me, I think most important is that we do that with agriculture. I think we need to do that, you know, you saw how we're trying to do that with manufacturing. We have to do that with everything. That's, um, speaking of crazy experiments, unlikely to work. That, oh. I started that last night. That's an LED light, a little air stone bubbler. And then I did straight biochar and urine, which like, I was, I was kind of wincing <laughs> setting that up. I'm like, no, we have to run wacky experiments. Like, I don't think it's gonna work. I'm pretty sure those plants are well on their way to dying, but like our farmers in Kenya, for example, they're with a biochar urine mix, they're getting better yields than the government recommended rate of application of DAP, a popular diammonium phosphate, a really popular fertilizer. This is going to be a disaster. I put it in here because I was worried it would smell horrible and attract a ton of flies and stuff. It doesn't really smell, which is nice, but um, you know, I'm still worried about it. I'll shut it down quickly if it gets much worse, but then like that gives me a data point, right? If I know that the pure setup doesn't work, then I can try like half biochar slash urine and half water. And then I can try like 10%. Like I don't know where the cutoff is. I'm not happy with the amount of data coming in from other places. So, you know, I can at least try this and publish my results. And yeah, it's a wacky one-off experiment and not, you know, super high rigidity, statistically significant data, but it's better than nothing. I'm not a brilliant guy. I'm not an engineer by training. I really think that these are problems that smarter people should have solved. I think it's empowering. Like, I mean, anyone now, we have the sum of all human knowledge accessible on a magical computer that we put in our pocket that costs less than a hundred bucks in the middle of Kenya. But like, that's a magical postmodern world to me. And we're crossing this threshold where you can produce more interesting, better products. Dieter Ram, his motto was less but better. Less but better isn't just minimalist. It's less but better is everything around you, to me, customized exactly to use. And we're getting close to a world where we can, I mean, we are, I'd argue, technically at a world where we can build that. It's just a matter of us doing it at this point. Even if it is failing half the time, like most of this now, that gets better faster. And it's just a matter of time before it catches up and then surpasses what a more centralized setup can do. This lettuce I was skeptical about, it literally overnight produced that flower. So yeah, not the strongest data point in the world, but interesting and also fun, right? Like that's cool to come to my crazy container workshop and see. The other day I came here, I had a 3D printing job going overnight. One of the gardening experiments was making progress and there's like two butterflies flying around like in this post-industrial 
in a lot of ways disastrous warehouse, that's cool. Like I can't complain when my 3D print job is actually working, the gardening experiment's going okay, and there's random butterflies all of a sudden in the middle of this. That's a good reminder that we've got a surplus of everything. You just need to take advantage of it.